So yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, how to organise your CSS to stop um, massive pain um, and also to talk a bit about uh, the latest and greatest in the CSS world, which is Tailwind, um, which is one of those things that, um, although it's come about very recently, um, it's really popular and the people that use it love it. Um, so it's well worth a look, um, but instead of jumping straight to Tailwind, I want to sort of take you on a little bit of a journey as to sort of how we ended up with Tailwind out there in the world um, and give you a sort of a, a foundation in what you would do if Tailwind wasn't an option, um, which up until recently it wasn't. Um, so what does a CSS architecture solve? Well, it stops you having bad CSS. And what I mean by bad CSS is CSS that you just can't touch, basically, uh, because you don't understand it when you read it. You don't know what it's really affecting or you can't be confident what it's going to affect, which crucially means you can't delete it. And being able to delete CSS is really where, when you know you're doing it right, when you feel you can delete some CSS with uh, confidence. And that, that should be a part of a, a maintenance of a, of a big project. Um, and also it's hard to add to for a very obvious reason that, that that's, I'm going to explain in a second. So this is a contrived example, but um, this is how I think it goes wrong for a lot of projects. Um, so you're tasked with developing this rather simple bit of UI, which is a simple card with a title, some text and a link in. And you get given all the specs and you think this is easy, this is fine. Uh, it's basically a div with three elements in give the div a class and you write a load of CSS and it looks perfect. And you do this quite quickly and it's fine. And then the next week, the same designer comes along and says, yeah, so we, we need that same card, but on the product page, it's not gonna have that title. It's gonna have two paragraphs of text in instead. So you think, okay, I'll just copy the card component with the three elements and replace the title element with another paragraph. And it doesn't look quite right. It looks like this one up here on the top. So you give it a bit more, you, a bit more CSS. You say, when this card is on the product page, you're going to do something different to it. So now it looks perfect again um, and all's well. And again, this is pretty quick to do um, and uh, everyone's happy. Now, a little while later, the same designer goes to you or, or someone else, perhaps, and they say, yeah, we want the same card that we've been using on the product page, um, but when we're using it on the description, we want the top paragraph to be bold. And uh, so you remove the link for a start, and then it looks all wrong still, like this this one here, you've got this strange margin at the bottom, uh, which shouldn't be there. And, uh, you know, there's no quick way to make this bold, um, except for maybe using the strong tag, but maybe you don't know about that. Um, so you qualify it again. You say, well, when, when the card has a description in it, we're going to remove the margins from the, pa pa from the paragraph. Um, and then we're going to have this special intro paragraph text. Um, which is going to be making it bold and giving it that margin again. And now, all, after all these simple changes, you have started a war, a specificity war. And over years, this can lead to some really terrible behaviour, like uh, eventually using the important tag or... <laughs> putting inline styles or even worse using JavaScript to write your CSS instead. So what's how do you stop this from happening? Now the sort of established 
architecture uh, is called inverted triangle CSS. And it's called that because of this sort of shape that it makes um, where you arrange your CSS into these layers where each layer gets more and more explicit and the specificity may go up towards the end, although it doesn't have to. I think ideally you want to keep your specificity at a level one all the way throughout. And this, this triangle, this sort of top to bottom is an exact representation of your single CSS sheet because after specificity, the next rule is which rule was uh, declared last is going to um, actually style the thing. Um, so what it promises is to define the dependency flow for a start um, and it stops you from depending on the details. And by details, I mean the HTML elements, or it rather it discourages that. Um, and as a, another bonus, if you've done it really well, everything in each layer, in theory, can be substituted for one other thing inside that layer. So it allows you to make changes quickly. Now, the the idea or the, the, the name was coined in uh, 2015. Uh, there's a link to the to the article that explains a bit more in depth. Um, but I I consider this a sort of emergent solution from the technology. Um, um, just here uh, in the sort of centre of the screen is an example of the first release of Bootstrap, and you can see that the 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 order of the imports is sort of a rudimentary version of the inverted triangle. And by their first sort of proper release, version two, which was the next year in 2012, their organization matches the inverted triangle almost exactly, except they've added a few more and the names aren't quite the same. But the general principle is there. So it's kind of the way to do it, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, how um, this is sort of roughly how the dependencies work in an inverted triangle uh, where everything from tools below will only depend on the tools and settings the other layers do not depend on each other um, and if they need to then something has to be abstracted and lifted up to the the tools or settings layer um, and it never goes the other way um, Otherwise, you can't swap things around. Uh, this is what your settings layer looks like. You, you will be familiar with this if you ever used Bootstrap or any sort of framework where you've got this settings file and you can kind of configure it. Um, this is where your design decisions live. So when you've decided what, what colors you're using or your font sizes, or even you've decided on space and time, which I, it gives me a, a little chuckle whenever I see the fact that I've included space and time in my settings. Um, so hopefully this one makes a, makes most sense. This is your variables, basically, more like constants, really. Um, the next level down is a combination of handy utility class, handy utility functions to um, perhaps write some future CSS easily. Um, or in this case, what my favorite section of it is, is I always have a mix ins file, which allows me to interface with my settings so that I don't depend on my settings directly. So um, on the left, I've got a, a map of values and we use this mix in to interact with the map instead of getting things from the map directly, which will give us a lot more options in the future and means we can use it in a more programmatic lay, way, which we'll come back to later. The next layer is the generic layer, which is basically where you have a CSS reset. Um, 
and your sort of things that are just obvious to have like the the border box thing is your sort of if you had nothing else you'd probably have this anyway um a reset comes in three flavors which is your um your aggressive flavor aggressive flavor I like that um which basically just just kills everything um if you have reset.css then it's like somebody's taken every single style the browser has given you and just completely taken it out so everything starts with padding zero and margin zero which um tailwind does this which we'll um introduce later um and then you've got your sort of rational rational flavor um, which basically removes the inconsistencies between the browsers um, to stop weird surprises if you you know haven't tested every device you sort of puts it to a reasonable baseline and basically just kind of kicks internet explorer with a with a stick and sort of tries to get it in line although it's not really a problem and my first personal, personal favorite and is what i would use with if i started a project today which is a minimal one where you know modern browsers they really kind of behave and if you believe that the rules that they set out are kind of sensible um then you'd only have a, a reset that's going to have only the most handy or most ubiquitous rules like the border box um next is where you actually start writing some real CSS, is where you're addressing the actual HTML elements and should be the last time you address an element in the, in the CSS. Um, after you pass this point, you should really not be addressing the individual elements at all. Otherwise, you saw what happened. Um, so here we've got like our buttons and forms and our typography we'd probably address all the headings here as well um the next one is probably the most difficult one to understand but if i had the power i would rename this layer containers so this would, uh, this has things like your grid system in it where in, in Bootstrap, for example, this is where the above approximately at this sort of level, this is where the grid system is made. Um, and this project from my builder, this is where we've got our sort of rudimentary layout system, which is very simple um, because it doesn't require a full grid system. And it's also got this sort of list of cards where once you put two cards together, they sort of the corners sort of square off and stuff like that um crucially these have no paddings applied to them except for the grid so i tell a lie um but yeah this one's probably the most difficult to understand um it's not exactly intuitive um next is probably the most easy to understand uh components and, th and this is what people in the in my contrived example this is where we jump to without doing the, any of the groundwork. So this is where um, most of the new CSS that's written after you've done your setup phase would would, would have happened. Um, so it's for more sort of complicated and fancy things, basically. Um, so like the navigation is a classic, classic example is probably one of the most difficult things to manage in your CSS is probably going to be a component or perhaps two. Um, or this nice accordion, which has got all sorts of icons and areas for, for things to live. Um, and this metro line, which has multiple states, you know, like at the top of a form with the, the numbers. So there, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, but it's it's all sort of encapsulated in this component um, because it's likely to change together. Um, and then you'd have your utilities. Now, this is a sort of foreshadowing of the uh, tailwind section, um, but this is what you would expect to have found in your in a utilities layer up until um, a couple of years ago. Those just absolutely handy 
um, utility classes just to do something that you know you always do but you, you really didn't want to write a full component for just to you know kind of move some text around or, or move a box around so how do we get this into our symphony project um so assuming you're using uh, webpack encore and assuming you already have a load of old CSS that you're not about to throw away um, because you don't have infinite time. Um, what I've done here is I've pointed Webpack at the old CSS and I've made a new folder for each layer. And I've numbered them so that they sit in the correct order. Uh, in the folder structure, which just makes me happy. Um, I tried it without, and it, I'm always sort of looking for the, the the folder I'm looking for. But this way, sort of, it always makes sense to me when I've got the numbers there. Um, and so now I've got Webpack to give me two style sheets, uh, and they're both using different um, CSS um, preprocessors, which is fine. Um, Webpack's taking care of all of that for us. So it was actually super simple just to, to implement this new thing side by side. Um, and then when you're just starting out, you might do some setup, um, you know, define some of your, your elements. Um, there's my, the examples I've written there in a component. Um, uh, but as the, the project grows, um, you can see some of the areas don't grow at all, like the um, the reset. There's never you're going to have multiple resets going on, um, and this is the settings level is really unlikely to grow further than those three files. Um, and our objects has only end up with um, three files, and it's again unlikely to grow past that the component section has got lots of things in it uh, which is expected and that's where most of the work um, is done uh, and we've also got a few more utilities which i'll get into later um, i always find it handy to um, add these sort of comments and i, I take them from that article um, that's linked and I have a link to the article and I label it so that if anyone else comes they, they kind of start understand that there's a sort of a reason for this list and if they don't understand it then hopefully they'll, they'll talk to me or, or at least read the article or something um, but what I don't want people to do is start randomly putting anything in there but what I do tell people is that if you're not sure just make a component and you can re we can refactor it later, so that's the safest option. If you if you if there's an established system, just make a component, and then it's all sort of encapsulated there at the very least. So let's do that. So let's say we want to take that card um, that someone erroneously addressed the HTML elements in, um, and we're going to stop the mess from happening um, ahead of time. So the very first thing we're going to do is put it in the components level um, and name it something more specific. Um, this, this is already an improvement. Um, by simply naming it article card and keeping it in its own thing, it will stop people using it in other contexts or at least question it. It kind of tells, tells people what it is. Uh, this card only actually works when it's an article card with, with the titles and stuff. And to, to change it, we really need to make something else perhaps. So this is going to help. Just doing this alone is going to help. Um, the next step would be to stop, stop depending on those elements properly. So here we're using the BEM syntax. Um, which is my personal favorite because it allows you to keep your specificity at one um, rather than what we could have here is like card and then dot title 
which would bump your specificity to two, which is just ridiculous. So we've used BEM, and this will compile to one class for each sort of block here. And then we can attach those classes to the HTML. And the next thing we want to do is get rid of what I'd call magic numbers. So uh, I think it's a maths term, but a magic number is like, you're not sure why it works, but it just, that's the word, that's the number that gives you the right answer. And that's what we've done with our paddings and font sizes and all sorts. There's no sort of reason for them, except that, well, they looked correct or that maybe they were in the spec. But by replacing the magic numbers with variables, it gives them validity and um, it's, uh, it, uh, yeah, it, it, ma it makes them proper, right? It, it, if you have magic numbers all over the place, um, there's no end to the different values that you can have. Um, also by doing this, it sort of means that hopefully other people will stop using them as well. So the, the two sort of benefits to sort of using variables or um, a really modern name for them is design tokens. Again, remember I said it in the settings file is where you keep your design decisions. So back when I was a print designer, um, I learned that um, having fewer options gives a more visually pleasing result often pretty almost always um, so by reducing those options it gives your design or your layout a sense of cohesion and purposefulness um, so for example i'd always set up a baseline grid and there was a set number of positions that things could exist on um, and it sort of makes things feel correct um, and the same is true if you've got like font sizes all over the place and you know you've got different pixel values of different gaps between things it's sort of it's visually messy and it's hard for your eye to sort of pass it and, and understand it the other more um more sort of programmery um benefit is that if you ever decided to migrate those values to something else and more sort of more modern or more useful or just better then you, you, you're free to do that so for example um, here all these font sizes have been replaced with a, a, a more fancy um, rem declaration which is probably more accessible and more flexible down the line um, and that was a really quick thing to do and it you know I did that with confidence that it wasn't going to mess up anything or change anything. So this is where we've ended up with, with our, we've got a little uh, twig component here um, and it accompanies the file name matches up with our component. Um, and we've got our BEM classes. Um, and this is good. This, you know, if you did this slowly in refactored your UI in this way, um, you would stop the specificity wars from happening. Um, great. But um, let's see what happens if we make more utilities. So remember that utilities layer only started off with a few really handy things like floats and, and text layouts um, but let's add some more for paddings margins font sizes like the heading classes um, and a couple for display um, you know for making something like display block or display flex for example so how do you make um, these utilities so if you're using um, less or SAS, the method is mostly the same. Um, 
you don't really have a lot of options for data structures in these languages. You've got a single variable and you've got a map, but the map can be nested with another map. Um, and you that's really all we need to do this. Um, so what we've done here is we've, we've defined our variables for space and then we've immediately repeated them in this map, um, which is a little frustrating. Um, however, the likelihood of these changing is quite low. And if they do change, then it's not really that difficult because we are going to have like a finite amount of these. These are human relatable values, they're design decisions. So hopefully we shouldn't have too many of them um, but having having them as straight variables and as a map uh, does mean that we can really easily include them directly but also loop the map so um, here we've got we've just made a loop um, and inside the loop um, it's making margins classes and some padding classes for each value it's found in the map. Um, that's it really, it's super simple. And if you did this for um, your margins, paddings, font sizes and display, then we can look at our article card again and replace these classes actually with our utilities. Here if you strong instead of a sort of font size utility. Um, but look at the amount of CSS we've managed to delete by just having those handful of utilities. Now, again, this is a quite a contrived example, but hopefully it give you a taste of what happens if you rely more on utilities, what more can you do? Um, and the reason why I think um, doing, and I'll come back to that later. Um, so once we've replaced all of the internals with these um, utility classes, the parent class isn't really an article card anymore. It's just a card. Um, and if we, if we don't have the padding involved in this card, then it becomes less of a component really it's too simple to be a component it doesn't really have any moving parts it doesn't have multiple things that are going to change together it's really a box that you can put stuff in kind of like a grid or a, a you know a, a, a list or something so here I've, I've moved it into um, a new file in the objects layer called containers um which might have a few other things like you know card with a bigger shadow or you know a gray area or something like that um and this is how we can solve those other two problems in the contrived example where we're not actually writing any new css to achieve it we're just changing some of the classes so to um, give it two paragraphs and 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 then to be a little bigger we can change our font size class and remove the strong tag um, and just kind of fix the margins in place um, and then similar story with with the next one so we, we've we've had zero new css to write and we've we've solved both of these problems um, and the reason why I think this works is that these sort of things, these really basic things like sizes and, and, and gaps between things um, are more tightly coupled to the content than they are anything else. So in this file, these classes are more tightly coupled to this, this text one variable than they are anything else. And that's why I think they live here. Um, our card class is fine, you know, we can define those 
a, a few of them and use them use them in lots of places but when the content changes normally the font size and the, the margins and stuff will change with it so some of you might be thinking well hang on you can't actually do this you you know you i i included um the two style sheets i got webpack encore to compile two of them and I just included them um that wouldn't work um because if you had both of them on the page you'd be fighting with the old one and your new css would be bad you would have to sort of quash the old css before it would even take effect um and removing the old css isn't really a practical option um if you think you might have to rewrite the navigation styling but then what about the other pages that you haven't migrated yet or the other areas so then you might end up with two versions of the of the navigation one in the one that's compatible with the old CSS, one with the new. I think you can easily understand why that would lead to terrible things happening. Um, and the only real option in that case is you'd have to rewrite. You'd have to rewrite everything before you could write anything. Um, and the, you know, it would take years, and then you could just start over again, and nothing would ever happen. Um, so here's this is sort of my idea and i tested this with some real css i couldn't find some really bad css but i i used some css i know well and work with at my builder but i included all of it uh, which is 10 12 years of writing css although it's actually not that bad at all um but there's still 12 years of css there it has it has the um it has Bootstrap 2 as a base, uh, and that's still sort of present in the code base. So it's all there. Um, and what I did is I added an ID to the HTML tag, uh, which I can include um, in, in, in each template with this has new CSS variable. So I could overwrite that. And then any page that I want to include my new CSS, it will print that ID and also include our new um, CSS tag style sheet. And then in SAS, I basically took all of the imports in the triangle structure and just put them inside a ID tag. So I've like nested them inside it. So this is effectively prefixed the entire new CSS. Now, so that should work for most cases because any number of any number of classes will be overwritten by a single ID. So once the uh, purple number or the top number um, has a, any any number of greater than zero, it doesn't matter how big the numbers below it are. Um, so we've trumped everything and it means that we don't have to write bad CSS. We don't have to use the important tag, which will have unintended consequences like overwriting inline styles. Uh, we don't have to try and beat the old CSS. And this sets a good precedent and keeps your code clean. Um, otherwise, there's just no point in doing it. You might as well slowly just refactor the old CSS. Um, now some of you might think well i've got multiple ids you know i might have like a main and then a sidebar and then a sign up form it might be three ids deep in there that's no problem because you can just repeat the same id using selector chaining and it will trump anything and you can do this you can do this up to 256 times so um if that doesn't help you and if that doesn't solve your problem and you do need more than 256 ids to override your old css then uh now 
is there's never been a better time to you know get into a different career um the my build trade academy has everything you need to start up your new career um in a practical trade um it's a really rewarding place to work um and you can leave all, all the, the your ids behind um so after sort of waxing lyrical about how good the utilities are um I'm not the only one to think that well, what what would what if you went really far with them what if you just went all in on IDs I mean on um utility classes so um we've got some examples here of sort of pre tailwind examples that didn't quite take off in the same way um we have the rather good tachyons um, which is quite good for small projects um, and the rather terrible atomic CSS. I say terrible because the classes that it ends up writing are madness. They're pure madness. I mean, you, you, you'd, need, you'd need to be referencing and looking these things up to actually understand what's going on or inspecting the element once it's rendered to the page. Um, and it just is just feels like see the same thing, but with extra steps and it abbreviates everything. Uh, I mean, who knows what DCLZ stands for? Um, I looked it up before the talk and I've forgotten, um, but you'd have to look it up. I, I decimal. Decimal leading zeros. There we go. Um, but this is just this is incomprehensible um, and is no better than than where we were. So this was an interesting idea to write to generate a load of CSS with JavaScript, but it never took it never went anywhere. Um, so the thing that um, although Tachyons was quite good at the time, although some people hated it because it had unsemantic classes, um, it wasn't responsive or it was only responsive in a sort of a limited fashion um, in that if your initial values were responsive values, then it would be, but you can have really responsive um, where things are relatively different on different viewports. So I mentioned before that you can um, make utilities by looping a map. Now, if you looped one map, and then another map inside that loop. That's all you need to make a set of um, responsive utilities. So what we've done here is we've looped our breakpoints map, and then in each breakpoint, we've wrapped it in a breakpoint using our mixin, and then looped our um, space map, which is going to output classes like this where they're prefixed with the breakpoint. And so now um, we can apply different rules at different breakpoints. So we can say, oh, when it's on mobile, we can have only a tiny bit of padding. And then on a on a as the screen gets bigger, we can have much bigger CSS, uh, much bigger um, padding that's not just the same but scaled up, if that makes sense. So this isn't a new method. And in fact, this is how Bootstrap uh, makes the grid, uh, is it will loop the a, a, set, a map of breakpoints and then sort of loop its number of uh, grid columns. So th this is not a new thing, um, but what Tailwind's done is it's sort of taken that responsive utility idea and just completely gone to town with it. And the difference between Tailwind and Atomic CSS is the class names are intuitive. Um, so you could jump straight to Tailwind and instead of doing all the other things I've said up until this point, um, you could just jump straight onto Tailwind. And if you did that, then you wouldn't have to bother with the architecture because everything's already, the specificity is already controlled um, because a utility can't have um, a specificity of higher than one 
really. Um, although once they get um, stateful or responsive, the specify goes up a tiny bit, but not really. Um, and the documentation for the Tailwind is brilliant. You know, the, the website is really good um, and it's really quick to navigate. It's got a really great search function. So you could, once set up, you can sit down with that and really get things done quickly um, and just, just kind of bash stuff out and really sidestep those architecture issues completely. And like I said, people who try Tailwind, they really enjoy it. It's very high, highly, like they have like a high NPS score if there, if there was one. Um, so I mentioned that it's taken on, it's taken the idea of responsive utilities really far, but it's also got these other prefixes as well, which makes it very powerful. So for example, with a hover prefix, instead of like a medium or large, you can change a background color of something. So all of your stateful stuff could just be listed out on, on the, in your HTML effectively. Um, now, if you want to get started with Tailwind in your Symphony project, um, I'm not going to say that it's easy. Uh, it did take me a couple of hours, even um, starting a new one, because I installed the latest version and um, it's not compatible with Webpack Encore currently. Um, I discovered this is a pretty common issue. Um, so make sure you install the post CSS 7 compatible version until instructed otherwise. Um, so at this point, you're going to get if, if you're sort of normally a PHP Symphony developer, you're going to be kind of horrified by the amount of dependencies that are about to come in just to write some CSS. But that's, you know, that's, that's just how it goes. Um, so we're going to need um, post CSS, a way to process it with um, uh, auto prefixer as well, and the actual Tailwind library, um, and another sort of way post CSS plugin that's going to sort of transform things properly at the end. Um, for the latest stuff, go to the uh, Tailwind site or follow this link here. Um, so you need three files, although the config is optional. Uh, it's really not optional. Um, <laughs> you kind of, you should, you should really have it. Um, you need a Tailwind config, a post CSS config, and then your CSS file. Um, you can see I'm including the extra plugins in the post CSS config here. Um, we're going to come to the Tailwind config, the Tailwind CSS file basically is just including three parts of the Tailwind library. The base is that CSS reset that we talked about in earlier on, which should be in your generic layer, um, which is completely nullifies everything. So if you have an existing project and you include this, it might produce some strange results. Um, so you might want to skip that or experiment with not including it. Um, the components layer um, is basically somewhat advanced usage of Tailwind where you kind of can glue a, a load of utilities together and def redefine them as a CSS class. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this, um, as it seems like doing the same thing, but with extra steps, but this is where their output, again, thinking about the traditional triangle structure, your components have to be before utilities, otherwise utilities don't work. Um, and really, if you want to use uh, Tailwind, you have to use purge CSS because it outputs thousands of classes. Um, so using purge CSS, it br brings in another, like it, it does, the Tailwind does have purge CSS built into it. You can just add 
into the um, config file uh, like areas to purge, but it didn't work for me in my Symfony project. Maybe I wasn't doing it right. So the sort of legacy route um, is to include purge CSS manually in in our Webpack on core um, in our Webpack config file, which means bringing in a load more um, dependencies uh, just to get it to start really. Um, now I would recommend having these three things um, in your project, but maybe the second two commented out until you need them later. You definitely want to be looking at your twig files. So what, what this is doing is it's looking at the CSS file that's output, looking at the files you point it to and only keeping CSS classes that are actually used. Everything else it will purge. And uh, it takes ages to do this. It uses regex and the law, uh, you know, it scales um, exponentially with your project. Um, this this project that, I, that you see this 30 seconds of eight seconds here, uh, is like a hello world type program it's really small and it takes forever so if you've got a really big project like this is gonna you know just buy a big server or something um but yeah you want to be making sure you're purging your twig templates um your javascript for any stateful classes maybe you've got an is hidden or something like that uh, and i would recommend looking at your form types in your project um, as the difference between some form types might just be a single class. So if, um, if like me, that doesn't really sound too great and you'd want to try and have a bit less of everything, um, what you can do is only include parts of Tailwind that you actually need. How am I doing for time? Am I running out of time? Running on a bit. It's fine. I'm near the end. Um, so uh, this is my alternative approach to um, having including everything and then immediately scrubbing it out again is carefully going through your config file and only including the utilities you're actually using in your project. So for example, here, what we've done is replaced our utilities for space, font, size, and colors, defined only those in our config. So it won't output all thousands of classes. It will only output these um, and only outputting the 12 spacing classes instead of the sort of 20 or so that it comes with. Um, and uh, even without purging, it was quite small in the scheme of things. Uh, so that might be an option for you. 